Today's lesson is going to focus in a little bit more specifically on the structure of DNA, how it's all put together, what the pieces are called, and then how DNA makes copies of itself. In the last video, we looked at a lot more of the kind of big picture, like in this next slide here, in terms of what was the role of DNA and kind of where did it exist in the body. So just as a review, remember that you've got trillions of cells. Every single cell has a nucleus. In every single nucleus, there's 46 chromosomes. Every one of these chromosomes unravels itself into this crazy long structure here called DNA. And if you remember from um, the video last time, DNA is incredibly long, um, but an incredibly thin chemical molecule. So how do we know what we know about DNA and how's it put together? So you may have heard of Watson and Crick, uh, but they were back in the 50s. Uh, their work, and it's these two guys up here. Uh, this is Watson over here. This is Crick over here. They had a lab assistant by the name of Rosalind Franklin, um, and they were working on trying to figure out whether or not DNA was the chemical responsible for heredity or if proteins were actually the res responsible for heredity because proteins are actually quite common in the cells. Um, and uh, because of the work that these gentlemen did, along with, like I said, Rosalind Franklin, their lab assistant, um, they realized that not only was DNA the material of heredity, but they were the ones that actually determined its shape. And this picture right here is kind of a famous uh, picture of, uh, they call it x-ray crystallography, kind of a cool name. But uh, from that picture, they could determine that the structure of DNA was like this. And you guys have seen this twisted ladder before. Um, this twisted ladder is called a double helix. And it's kind of an, an uneven twist. Notice how certain parts of the ladder are close together, and then there's certain parts of the ladder where there's kind of a big gap. So it's not a perfect spiral like your rotini pasta, um, but it's pretty close to that, that same idea. And again, they, they realized that there were edge pieces. Uh, in this picture, it's kind of this orangish color and this blue color. Those were the backbone. And then there was these sort of rungs across the middle that were made up of these chemical compounds, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So a little more specific about it. Uh, number one, the double helix is, like I said, it's a, an asymmetrically twisted ladder. It is a twisted ladder, but there's wide spots and, and narrow spots to it. Um, that We knew that there was something on the sides, and these sides are here are made up of sugars and phosphate molecules. And if you take a look at this drawing right down here, you can see there's a phosphate and a sugar, then a phosphate and then a sugar, and phosphate and a sugar. And then way back when, a few units ago, remember we talked about what a nucleotide was, and it's that chemical molecule that makes things up. But the vertical parts of the ladder, again, are made up of sugars and phosphates. We call those the backbone. And there's that term right there. Across the center, all these horizontal pieces, they started to realize were made of these things right here called nitrogen bases. Here's our term. Those would be our rungs. Because they always come together, they're also called base pairs. And one of the things that they realized was that there's two particular kinds of base pairs. Adenine always pairs with thymine. And cytosine and guanine always pair together. Uh, you never see a, a thymine and a guanine or an adenine and a cytosine. They just don't go that direction. And then the last thing to know about this is that down the center, you'll see these little dashed lines going down the middle. There's that key term, hydrogen bonds. It's a weak hydrogen bond that holds the two sides together, kind of like the two sides of a zipper. It's held together by sort of a weak um, fit in the middle so that you can unzip and rezip the zipper, and that's kind of a key part to it. If you think about it, if a zipper was super glued shut, it really wouldn't do us any good. Same thing if these bonds down the center were really, really strong, we wouldn't be able to unzip it, which is a process that you'll see here in a little bit. So in terms of this stuff, some critical ideas that you need to know about how this works. Number one, there's a term we call complementary base pairing. And again, that's the fact that A's and T's go together, or T's and A's, um, and then G's and C's go together. And the reason for this is due to their hydrogen bonding sites. And you can kind of see that this kind of zone down the center here, this is what represents those weak hydrogen bonds. And you can see C and G actually have three hydrogen bonds, and A and T only have two hydrogen bonds between them. And that's actually what allows the A and T to bond with one another. These guys have bonding sites that match up. If an A were to try to meet with a C, the two bonding sites would not meet up with the three bonding sites, and so they simply don't pair together. So that's called complementary base pairing. A and T bond together, and C and G bond together. Second thing to keep in mind is that the structures of these molecules have a little bit of a different shape to it. And this is this bottom part down here, is that the adenine and guanine molecules are a little bit wider. They have uh, two rings that make up their structure, and they're called purines is the technical name for them. I'm not going to really test you on the terms purine and pyrimidine unless you want a four. Uh, but these adenine and guanine molecules are a little bit wider. If you look in this drawing to the top right, see how the adenine's a little bit wider? Here's the guanine, same kind of thing. The cytosines and the thymines 
are shorter, and that's down in this bottom left. They're a single ring structure, those are called pyrimidines, but they only have one ring. So this ladder, this DNA helix, can stay a constant width from left side to right side because of the fact that A and T are different lengths. If you had two adenines together, it would be a wide spot in the ladder, or two thymines together, it would be a skinny spot in the ladder. But the fact that an adenine and a thymine always got bond together gives you one width, and then the fact that a guanine and a cytosine always bond together gives you that same width. So all the time when you do these, you always get a pair that's got uh, a certain number of hydrogen bonding sites, and then it's always a wide molecule and a skinny molecule, a purine and a pyrimidine that always bond together across the center. So those are your two key ideas, especially that complementary base pairing, that there's different hydrogen bonding sites, and that's what allows adenine and thymine to mix, um, you know, meet with only each other. And then the fact that we've got this kind of um, two to one ring ratio versus these guys in the two to one ring ratio also allows for that uh, DNA molecule to have a consistent width. And we'll come back to that consistent width here when we talk about error checking, uh, error checking later on in this little clip. So next piece, the fact that we've got complementary pace bearing, um, the fact that A's and T's and C's and G's only go with each other allows for a very efficient replication process. And this is the key word. When DNA makes a copy of itself, that is called DNA replication. And this has to happen any time that a cell wants to make a copy of itself. It happens during uh, interphase, actually the synthesis part of interphase. And basically what happens is that going this direction, this strand unzips itself. And you kind of see here's the unzipper spot right there. This spot is going to move down the chain this direction. And as it unzips, it kind of allows a spot here where there's some unbonded base pairs. And there's free nucleotides in the cell. They come in and match up. So here you can see there's a, a, a C is bonding with a free G. Here's an A about to bond with a T. In this spot right here where the C is, a, a G is going to move into that spot. And same thing happens up at the top. And as these things kind of meet, uh, a, a, a chemical, an enzyme, there's a bunch of them, will come along and rebuild that new spot where you've got that new backbone molecule of sugars and phosphates kind of get laid along in that spot. So we have an unzipping process. We've got nucleotide pairing, occurs right in here. And then finally, it's got to re-zip back together to make two final strands. So again, you can kind of imagine this, this spot right here, it's called the replication fork, sort of slowly moving this direction as the DNA unwinds, and then sort of backfilling in behind it as these little spots get, get filled in. A little closer look at this. This process is actually called semi-conservative replication. So you can kind of imagine that if this was our original DNA strand here, number one, it would unzip right down the middle. And as it unzipped down the middle, it would separate into two different strands. And you can see the left strand, right strand, just like the two different sides of a zipper. And then new base pairs, new bases that are, are kind of, like I said, out in the cytoplasm, are free to sort of bond and build that new side. And so the term semi-conservative, this term that's up at the top, means that of the two new strands, each new strand consists of half the original strand and half a new strand. That's that phrase conservative. It's conserving half of it, and that's why it's semi-conservative. So again, there's a, a, a combination that when it, when it uh, replicates itself, that each new strand is half the original template and then half a reconstruction. The other side is still half of an original uh, template and then half of a reconstruction. <clears throat> Mutations sometimes do happen. This uh, process isn't exactly 100% error proof. So if you can see up in this uh, original DNA up here, we should have C and G, G and C, and T and A. And sometimes when you do replication, like this would be one half of it over here, this side replicated correctly. We've got the same base pairs. They match up and all is well. But sometimes, for a variety of different reasons, you can get mistakes made. So you can see this pair is correct. The G and C is fine. The T and A is fine. That's like the original pair. But this pair up here is incorrect, and we would call that a mutation. Uh, again, it's just an incorrect base pair. Um, in this particular case, there's a G from the original strand, but this T here is incorrect. And again, that's an error that can be made. Luckily, most of these errors can get picked up and corrected. So this slide shows some of how the error correction takes place. I know these look like little spaceships here. They're supposed to represent like this little green and this little blue guy. These are supposed to represent different kinds of enzymes. And enzymes, again, are little chemical molecules that do a lot of work in the cells. They're proteins. Uh, but here you can see that this green little enzyme is noticing that there's a wide spot. And they can literally sense that. They go down and check to make sure that the strands are absolutely parallel. And so there's a mistake there. And this particular little green enzyme can go and then delete that mistake. A second enzyme then comes in and it's putting the correct 
base into that spot. And you can see there's that white base where it's supposed to be. And then finally a third one comes along and will rebuild that sugar phosphate bridge. So enzymes are a big part of how um, this DNA process, this replication process happens. Um, and then it's also a big part of how errors and mutations can be taken care of because mutations oftentimes are certainly not healthy for individuals. Okay, there you go. Last things. Uh, if you're looking for a four, um, there's a few different ideas on here for you. Uh, so number one, you should be able to explain, uh, or you could go look up, why uh, proteins were originally thought, you know, that time of Watson and Crick, that, that proteins might have been that molecule of heredity and not DNA. In fact, that was pretty common for a number of years. Um, you can take a look at some more about the work of Watson, Crick, and Franklin. How exactly did their work uh, give us that idea of that uh, uh, double helix model, and, and what sorts of evidence did they use to support that? Um, Thirdly, you could take a look at um, the other models of, of replication that are, are um, were, I should say, um, put forth. We talked about the semi-conservative model. There are some other ideas for maybe how DNA could unzip and rebuild itself, and you would need to give some of that evidence for how we know that the semi-conservative model is more correct. And then you could take a look at some of these enzymes. There's a ton of enzymes that are involved in this uh, replication process, from the unzipping to the pairing to the rewinding process. And you can give me some of the names of those things that would be involved and, and talk specifically about how their, uh, what their role is. What you guys need to be able to do is if I give you a DNA strand, like a sequence of letters, A, T, C, G, you should be able to show me how that DNA would unzip, how it would then reform, and then how it would rezip. It's a pretty straightforward process. I don't think you'll have too much trouble with it, um, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.